Assalamualaikum and good evening everyone. Thank you for finding your time and joining our CME today by CME Metric My. I'm Adila, your moderator for today. And after so long, actually today we are running our CME on two platforms, uh, which are Facebook Live and uh, Zoom as well. So at, at Metric My, uh, professional, we are committed on providing exceptional learning experiences. We ensure that our as team speaker are recognized experts in their fields. So our topic today is prenatal, prenatal testing, screening, and diagnosis. So before we begin, I would like to remind, if you have any question, you can write in Q&A &A box. Uh, and also in Facebook, you can write in a comment box. And we will address your questions to at the end of our session. And from today's CME, you will get one CPD point we will give the link for the e-certificate and also CPD for at the end of our session. And the link, we will, we will only open for 30 minutes. So after that, we close the link. Lah. So without further ado, I would like to invite our amazing speaker for today, Dr. Nur Afida binti Datuk Mat Yusof, a consultant obstetrician and gynecology, maternal fetal medicine specialist from Hospital Sungai Petani Kedah to share with us valuable knowledge on prenatal testing. So welcome, Dr. Afida. Assalamualaikum and good evening, everyone. Uh, we before we start, I would like to take a few uh, second uh, for us to uh, be in silent and recite Al Fatiha uh, in accordance to one of our co coordinator of this uh, professional matric CME just uh, lost her mother-in-law. So Al Fatiha, Smith. Okay, before, um, without any delay, uh, let me share the screen first. Okay, this, this presentation today, uh, can everyone saw my slide? Okay, so the topic today, I'll be talking about prenatal testing, screening, and diagnosis. So I'll make this topic uh, general so that, that uh, the audience, either from um, general practitioner uh, who are pra practicing uh, antenatal care, uh, obstetrician, and probably a bit too basic lah, for maternal fetal medicine specialists. Okay, so this is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to talk a bit about the basic, what is screening test, what the difference between screening test and diagnostic testing, uh, the, the prenatal testing for maternal, uh, and prenatal testing for fetal, the one who, uh, all these tests have been practicing in uh, internationally, some probably in Malaysia, some um, mostly in internationally, and basic uh, genetic testing and what message to bring home. So this is WHO criteria for basic screening tests. So as you know, these 10 criteria must uh, be applied when we want to do a screening test I, for any kind of diseases. So it should be an important health problem. Uh, it, there must be accepted treatment if the disease is recognized. There must be a facility for available for diagnosis and treatment, uh, and it's, it's suitable for diseases that have latency and systematic stage. Uh, it, the test must be suitable to be used, and it should be acceptable to the population. Uh, the natural history of the disease should be understood, and there is should be an agreed on policy on whom to treat. And the cost should be uh, suitable, right? economical balance with overall uh, health cost. And the case finding or the, the disease testing should be continuous process. It shouldn't be like one off testing. Uh, although you will see that some probably wouldn't apply all in uh, antenatal condition, uh, but um, I must say that most of the prenatal testing are important health problem. So what is the diagnostic test? So if you remember this um, chart, 
uh, the difference between sensitivity and uh, specificity. This is also the basic understanding of the difference between diagnostic testing and screening tests. So screening tests should be more sensitive uh, and the diagnostic test should be more specific. So the sensitivity uh, just means that uh, most of the false negatives should be on the smaller scale. And for specificity also, the one that uh, false positive should be on the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the specificity should be false negative in small scale and the sensitivity should be false positive on the small scale here. So this is actually overlap. Okay, so the sensitivity will test on overall, well, specificity will test on the true diseases. That's what it means. Probably this will explain further. Uh, it means the same thing. Uh, so the false negative and false positive cut should be on the same, same cut off. You can see here. Uh, in most testing antenatal, they will take uh, two standard deviation or about 5% false positive as a standard. So this another way to understand uh, for a screening test on this left side. Uh, uh, sorry, this is diagnostic test. This is screening test. So screening should be have high sensitive. It able to test a lot of people, but the diagnostic test should be able to detect the true diseases. Okay. So let's go on the prenatal testing of maternal diseases. So I highlight two two diseases that uh, are two diseases are, that are important. One is gestational diabetes mellitus. So guys, gestational diabetes mellitus or GDM is very specific during pregnancy only. I'm not talking about pre-existing diabetic. So before we start on GDM, you must understand the nature and cause of the disease. So if you remember back then, uh, in early 2000s, there's a trial that has been done. HAPO trial, one of the landmark study that tried to uh, demonstrate the cause disease of GDM. So as you see, uh, from this HAPO trial has been shown that uh, the tests are done on 25,000 women in different centers and were blinded. Uh, they take a cut point of uh, diabetic uh, pre-diabetic, pre-pregnancy diabetic level and uh, they, this is without treatment. You just see overall the outcome and it, it's shown that the outcome uh, of those at below diagnostic pre-pregnancy diabetic level, that means uh, the uh, non-pregnant level, still showed an adverse outcome. So this is just want to show that the level that we should use to diagnose GDM in pregnancy cannot be the same like pre-existing diabetic. Okay, this is HAPO trial. Followed by HAPO trial, there's another trial was done, which is uh, uh, ACOIS, huh? Australian Carbohydrate Intolerance in Pregnancy. This, this trial just basically shown that uh, those women who've been diagnosed as GDM, uh, some of they have been randomly assigned. So half of them receive treatment. Treatment can be dietary advice, sugar control, monitoring, and even insulin therapy, and uh, half of it without treatment. And it, from this test, it, those who those women who receive treatment has actually have better outcome in terms of their mobility, perinatal mobility, and also overall quality of life. So from this on, there's a lot of other trials that have come up. So I, I want to show this as a confusion because why even up to now, my, there's a lot of uh, international body has come up to uh, what cut point of the uh, level that for us to diagnose GDM and they seem not to be able to agree on one. So the one that I put in yellow is uh, from Malaysian, uh, GDM, Nation uh, Diabetes in Pregnancy Guideline in 2016, uh, is a bit outdated because it should be outdated, updated in five, five years, which is should be any time now. So the cut point taken by Malaysia is uh, fasting as 
but the one as two hours is 7.8. So it doesn't follow either um, in uh, International Association of Diabetes Pregnancy Study Group, which has actually been used by a lot of Southeast Asian countries. Uh, it also doesn't follow the NICE or ACOG, which is a bit higher on 5.6. Okay, but as you know, Malaysian population is actually high in instant in diabetes. Recently, our uh, health survey has shown that our population uh, there's markedly increase in both pre-existing diabetic and also GDM. Uh, so this this is one of our main uh, uh, issue in Malaysia. Okay, so even if still not the best, but we know that by testing and treat, uh, we can reduce the complication in pregnancy. So what are the complications in pregnancy? As most studies are mentioned, in GDM, the complication mainly are uh, perinatal. That means on the fetus. So they can uh, have uh, macrosomia. They can present it with polyhydramnios leading to abnormal lie and end up with cesarean section. They also can have... Uh, uh, effect on the prenatal mortality or mortality positively if the sugar is not controlled and even causing death huh, of the baby. Okay, so uh, I'm not touching on management here. We are talking about the good testing and uh, a good uh, diagnosing test. So diabetic is out the window. So uh, even that there is no one a real cut point test for you, for you to use, but you know that if you treat the patient, the outcome is good. So as a Malaysian who working in the government's uh, uh, facilities, most are using Malaysian guideline. You can even use the uh, uh, International Association of Diabetes Pregnancy Study Group's cut point because this is the test that has been used mostly by uh, Southeast Asian. Or you can even use a NICE guideline, huh? which is a UK guideline. The most important is this woman don't really need just a testing. They need continuous assessment. That means throughout the process. You cannot just test and then let go the patient, especially those with a high-risk group. So once you're testing, even if negative, you have to see them back at second or third trimester and look at the uh, progression of the uh, pregnancy, whether there's any complication of of diabetic in pregnancy. If there is, then either that you have to retest. The guideline mostly uh, recommend for retesting even at a later gestation. But even if fail, sometimes you have to treat them as diabetes and uh, probably have to deliver early if any combination occurred. So this is the dilemma in GDM. How about uh, another disease that has caused uh, one of the top five of maternal death uh, in Malaysia and also one of the commonest, commonest uh, maternal cause of maternal death in over the world, uh, which is preeclampsia. As opposed uh, of GDM, preeclampsia is a bit different because the nature and cause of disease is not really fully understand, under, uh, been understood. Even with a long standing of research, we still, we still couldn't pinpoint what is really the uh, pathophysiology of the, this disease. There is a lot of theory being circulated. Among others is uh, a few of uh, serum or biomarkers that has uh, been studied and trying to explain about the disease. But one of the uh, most of the theory actually pinpoint to placenta. So placenta as the uh, main uh, reason of the changes in the maternal blood vessels and overall hypertension. And it's not just hypertension, preeclampsia is actually a multi-systemic disease. Uh, it's a syndrome. It made changes in a few organs, as I mentioned, as is shown in this picture. So it can make changes in the liver, it can make changes in the kidneys, and uh, even the brain. Uh, this is quite late. If occur in the brain, is already in a late uh, presentation. We don't want this. We want to try to predict before this all complication occurred. That's the main aim of all the studies has been developed in order to uh, detect the disease early and um, hopefully uh, 
prevent from the completion has been occurred. So as I mentioned, disease is not fully understood, but there's a risk factors has been uh, risk factors uh, has been developed as a predictor. And we know there is a prophylaxis treatments to reduce the complication of this. Unfortunately, um, prophylaxis uh, aspirin, so one of the earliest studies done on preeclampsia using aspirin as a prophylaxis is CLATS trial. So I think most of you in a student time remember CLATS trials back in 1984. So it has been shown to prevent preterm birth due to preeclampsia. So it doesn't actually stop the progression of disease, it just delayed it. So overall, preeclampsia is still unpredictable and it can occur rapidly. Okay, so it's still a um, major problem over, all over the world. But what we have developed over the year. Mm -hmm. So I'm showing you, this is quite a recent uh, uh, publication um, produced by one of the trainee of uh, Dr. Prof. Nicolette founder of Fetal Medicine Foundation. So it showed the uh, timeline of how that we develop a, a prediction model for preeclampsia. So Dr. Leona Poon in Hong Kong is one of the main researcher. So it started back in 2009, slowly been developed until in 2019, when Fetal Medicine Foundation triple test has been used and has been tested in some country. In Malaysia, it's still not been applied uh, as a universal screening uh, because we don't have yet the manpower. So what is Peter Medicine Foundation uh, triple test thing for preeclampsia? Okay, so in a uh, uh, aspirin trial, you see here in 2017, so the aspirin has been recommended most mostly in international body around this year, 2011-2013. So aspirin trial is one of the trials that actually do uh, uh, a randomized trial of uh, this uh, first trimester screening testing. Huh? So more uh, systematic, systematic testing when it used uh, risk factor, uh, the blood pressure, the uterine R3 uh, Doppler, the use positive index, and also maternal serums. Uh, two serums has been used, which is uh, PAPA, pregnancy associated plasma protein A, and PIGF, uh, which is both are actually a placenta factor, gross factor. So uh, based on this, they managed to confirm the finding of previous study. Uh, it's as not as good as most of the screening tests are, uh, other than preeclampsia, which is only 76% uh, detection rate uh, and the screen positive of 10.5%, which is still uh, uh, screen positive rate is, is not good but the false positive also stay high. We want it this to be less than 5%, but better than nothing. So a lot of country now has actually uh, been using this, uh, this uh, predictor model as a first trimester screening uh, in order to detect uh, preeclampsia. Uh, they want to make sure that which one is high risk and which one is low risk. It's not actually one you test the you using it as a first trimester test, then you let go of the patient. No. Uh, one of the recommended recommendation given is that once you diagnose, because it was done very early, uh, 11 to 13 weeks. As you know, that some women, especially primary gravida, uh, who develop preeclampsia later, don't have any risk factor except primary gravida. So if they use this testing and they false into the high risk group, they will be given aspirin and calcium as prophylaxis as early as 12 weeks. And they should be follow up until at least 34 weeks. Huh? So if the prions are developed along the way, then they should be delivered early before the complication occurred. So just to recap, severe preeclampsia can cause uh, HEP syndrome, 
uh, then can also cause a severe uh, hypertensive crisis. Among others, complication of preeclampsia are eclampsia, which is a seizure. Uh, it can cause complication like uh, intracranial breath, uh, bleeding if it's not been detected and treated early. It can also cause a liver hemorrhage. It can cause IUGR and de uh, fetal death. It can cause a brachial placenta. Okay, so what is uh, the test has been stipulated over the year just to show you the difference in terms of the uh, false positive uh, rate and detection rate. So uh, from uh, the study by uh, the latest one eh, in 2022 by Chen Sai Tong, uh, they actually able to increase the detection rate up to 90%. If use, uh, if uh, in if use all the four uh, risk factor, maternal artery, uh, uh, blood pressure, maternal blood pressure, and atrial uh, artery PI, and also serum markers, it able to detect ninety percent detect preeclampsia before thirty two weeks. Huh? so if you see, we trying to uh, reduce the number of preterm birth due to preeclampsia. But in terms of uh, late preeclampsia, it's not yet a good test. So there are other tests can be done, which is serum marker based in prediction of late preeclampsia. Uh, but the one that they are, we are trying to do is the preterm um, pre preeclampsia. Okay. So this is from the same paper. It just uh, trying to uh, make it universal in terms of how to take a proper blood pressure to be used in the screening. So just want to share with you. Uh, if you're interested, you can read mm. the journal. It's a very good journal. Uh, and I put the reference here. Okay, so how a proper blood pressure taken. So if you, you're using a different way, then you might not produce the same result. So you turn Arti Doppler is uh, um, a very specialized skill that you can do uh, as early as first trimester. So uh, this need to be credential, unfortunately. Uh, if you're interested, you can do on your own by sending picture to Fetal Medicine Foundation and get you, yourself credential. But uh, testing is not the only way. Remember, it should be continuous process. So you cannot just test, put the patient as high risk and then... Um, Forget about the patient, no. So this is the step to be followed. Okay, I am not intended to teach you how to do internal Doppler, PI. Uh, you are supposed to check PI on both sides and then uh, divide by two. And use that number in the calculation. So there is actually an algorithm to use to get the, in terms of uh, risk factor, you can go, you can get the algorithm in the Fetal Medicine Foundation's uh, website. Okay, that's all on. Uh, I only take two because this is uh, the two most important diseases that has still become a um, uh, um, uh, main uh, main problem in managing managing patient in antenatal care. Uh, because one, you know the cause of disease, but uh, you unable to decide the level of detection. One. You don't understand the cause of this, but somehow you're able to get the how to predict it. Uh, so this is over the years uh, work, uh, uh, hard work to get into the current uh, uh, situation, the current uh, achievement. So this is more uh, a better number in terms of prediction is in prenatal testing of uh, fetus, which uh, main one is trisomy 21. Why trisomy 21? But 20 years, uh, trisomy 21 is the commonest uh, chromosomal abnormality that occurred. And it is 95% are due to non dysfunction That means uh, anyone uh, without risk factor can have baby with Down syndrome. Uh, although the risk increase with age. Uh, so the, the the evidence has shown that the risks are actually increased with age. So as high as one in 300 for 35 years old and one in 100 in one uh, in 40 years old and in 45 as high as uh, one in 30. Yeah? 
So why you must know this risk uh, assessment is in terms of counseling. So this is just based on age. So it's not good enough yes, to predict just based on age. So, um, so what is Down syndrome? So even though that uh, um, people with Down syndromes have some um, disability, but throughout the years, uh, a lot of research has been done that actually has shown improvement in terms of quality of care. Uh, maybe we are unable to see in Malaysia, but in the places uh, like America and Australia, there a lot of research has been done and they're able to show that their quality of life almost similar. Some of them are almost similar like um, normal chromosome people. Okay, So average life expectancy has improved from uh, 25 years back in 1980s to 60 years in uh, 2020 and uh, in Australian this is a study done in Australian has shown that um, they actually want uh, more right of uh, overall um, uh, to in term of their well-being uh, their, their right to, to have a good quality of life they want to have a relationship they want to participate in community uh, so a lot of uh, com uh, foundation actually are, are focusing on this area. So uh, self-reported means from uh, adult with Down syndrome has shown that they have uh, they actually shown higher than proxy in terms of quality of life. Uh, but however, of course, in terms of research, this is a bit uh, difficult to reproduce uh, in terms of comparison with. Uh, non down syndromes uh, adapt mm. so this is one of the foundation in australia they able uh, it just been published a few years back and again uh, there's a lot of uh, movement about uh, doing on the the rights of uh, adult or children with down syndromes to get adequate uh, adequate educations so uh, Professor Faraha actually get uh, he she get, this is a professor trying to get the uh, research assistance from the adult with Down syndrome themselves, and they actually able to give a guideline of what is uh, adequate uh, education opportunity for um, children with Down syndrome. So they actually did a study on Asian countries and unfortunately Malaysia is not one of the countries being studied. So uh, a lot of work must be done on this area. So what are the implications of this when the quality of life of people with Down syndrome has improved is that a lot of our countries has changed their way of uh, screening um, Down syndromes in pregnancy. So a few, 20 years back, it's become a mandatory screening and now it's become a um, optional, optional testing. That means they ask the mother whether they want to do or not. So this uh, screening strategies is not new. It's been, it's been there for many years. Uh, some countries are still using it. So first trimester and second trimester. So different, different combination of screening has this difference, um, uh, false difference, uh, PPV, uh, positive predictive value and detection rate. Uh, if you see an anti scan alone only detect about 70% of cases. So can, if you use this alone, you have to tell the patient. So uh, if you combine, then it's improved, detection improved. Okay. I just want to show you this was what was done uh, many, many years before. Okay. So what changed now? So uh, I know that people are probably expecting me to talk about this NIPT of free cell DNA, which has changed the way that we practice in terms of fetal uh, screening uh, in uh, in. Uh, chromosome abnormality. So over the years, people are based on uh, ultrasound in terms of doing a screening. This is back in 90s to early 2000. 
So genetic sonogram is actually an ultrasound marker being used together with uh, some of the serum, marker, serum markers uh, to detect, to, to predict and then offer in terms of offering patient with more a diagnostic test. Huh? So now with NIPT, it changed. Huh? 2000 to now, uh, a lot more research was done on NIPT. So this is one of the tests that has, has very high, um, uh, high numbers of research been done in a short period of time. Okay, so what is Safri DNA? So Safri is the discovery is actually by accident. So they actually do a, a, a test trying to find a way uh, to see a, a maternal a, a centrifuge the maternal blood and they found the fragments of fetal cell. So using a few methods of developments, they'll be able to collect these uh, fragments of DNA and only by 2008, uh, this uh, fragment DNA using a very advanced uh, methods of next generation sequencing, which is a genetic testing method, they'll be able to uh, use it to test for uh, trisomy. Okay, so uh, this is the early uh, uh, development of the test. Now, uh, there's a lot more of cutting edge uh, testing has been done, including whole genome sequencing, uh, which is one of the, the, the most advanced testing, and it has further improved the performance of NIPT. So NIPT is a blood test. Okay, we take the blood from the mother and uh, from blood uh, from the blood, uh, we able to get a cell-free fetal DNA, which is a fragment. So then there are a few of the protocol must be followed. So one of few is that the fetal fragment must be adequate. So anything less than four percent is deemed as uh, inadequate. So uh, different um, different lab had using a different type of technology. So they will mention it. Uh, but most of the technology has been tested and produced almost similar results. So as you see, NIPT, uh, one of the tests that uh, achieve what is supposed to be a good screening test because it's more than 95% sensitivity. And even in the false positive rate also less than 5%. Okay, so it's almost as good as the diagnostic test. Okay, but why it was not deemed as diagnostic test? Okay, I'll explain further later. Okay, so this is to show you that uh, NIPT has been showing a good result in terms of detecting a trisomy, especially this three trisomy. Uh, 21 is very good, 18 and T13. Uh, uh, but on, for sex chromosome, uh, sensitivity was not that good. Uh. But uh, as for now, uh, the international consensus um, only used for this three trisomy. Okay, so what is diagnostic testing for Down syndrome? So it's still a karyotyping. So karyotyping, uh, we have to get a sample from uh, directly from the uh, amniotic sac. Uh, so we get an amniotic cell through amniosynthesis which is done as early as 16 weeks, or you can do get a from coronic sample, which is from the placenta, as early as uh, 14 weeks. Huh? So both, both uh, tests have their own uh, complication risk, and uh, amniosynthesis plus carotyping is deemed as a gold standard. CPS has more risk of mosaicism. But why it was done early, usually the aim of early diagnosis, unfortunately, is for termination of pregnancy. If you do it late, then in some country, termination cannot be offered and it will be too risky for the mother to perform termination of pregnancy. Okay, so uh, basic karyotyping is mandatory you know, for the NSIC test, uh, but there are other type of tests that can be done together with basic karyotyping, such as qPCR, which is the fish test. That means they use uh, fluorescence to highlight the abnormality of the chromosome. And microarray is more extensive, microarray and whole genome sequencing is more extensive testing. Okay, so this is just to uh, show you 
the images from uh, chronotyping uh, report. So chronotyping is a good test to demonstrate in terms of uh, abnormal in numbers such as trisomy. So you can see for Tau syndrome, there will be three numbers of three copy of the 21. So this is normal chronotype. Okay. Okay, how about trisomy 13 and 18? So trisomy 13 and 18, how I remember, 13 is 3, so it's patau. 18 is 8E, which is uh, Edward. Okay, so the occurrence of disease is similar as uh, T21. That means it's through uh, non-disjunction. Uh, means everyone can have either Edward or patau uh, fetus. But it is more is rarer than Down syndrome. So 18 occurs one in every 6,000. For 21, overall risk in population is about one in 1,000. So this one in one is 6,000 to 8,000 live births. 13 is about one in every 8,000 8, to 12,000 live births. Uh, the only good thing about these two trisomy is that uh, most of the cases are there is anomalies present. So it can be diagnosed by ultrasound. However, gold standard uh, diagnosis is still through chirotyping. Lah. That means you have to get chirotyping report in, if you want to proceed with termination of pregnancy. So this is little malformation, little chromosomal malformation. So uh, trisomy 13 usually have central defect, uh, craniofacial defects, cleft lip, abnormal brain, while uh, 18 usually have limb abnormality, and uh, in in try try and close restriction, okay. So for thirteen and eighteen, if you detect early uh, confirmation with chirotyping, uh, most uh, mater maternal fetal medicine species offered termination of pregnancy as it is a little malformation, especially in a mother if uh, have a risk uh, for for complication, for example, if you have thirteen and eighteen, there's possibility of anomaly lie that end can end up in section. And section is a known um known procedure that have high risk of complication. So this is the uh, reason why we offer termination of pregnancy if it's uh, detected early, usually before twenty two weeks. Similarly, like an encephaly. Okay, so anyone who are familiar with NIPT testing knows that most lab actually offered expanded expanded um, version. Uh, means they have uh, expanded testing uh, for micro deletion for uh, some uh, single gene defect. So uh, the problem with this is that all these tests are actually uh, uh, not. Uh, doesn't achieve a target for screening tests using NIPT. So for sex chromosome, detection rates varies uh, for uh, as as uh, as as high um, as high for Fortner syndrome, which is XO, and uh, up as high as forty two percent and down to five percent for uh, triple genetic like Kelly Felter. So for rare autosomal trisomies, uh, a study published by uh, Patel actually showed that uh, only five cases out of six were turned out to be um, true disease. Uh, so NIPT actually failed to use as a screening for this condition. So NIPT also, uh, uh, for, so far for black, uh, it has been quite promising, but however, you must use it with care. Lah. You still need a confirmation test. And uh, this, all these that I mentioned, even num uh, abnormal copy, that means triplodies, uh, NIPT still unable to uh, show a promising report. So you still need a color typing. Uh, this, is, this information is very important, especially when the test come back as, um, low risk uh, and IMT report came by as well. It doesn't always mean 100% uh, normal fetus. Uh, that's why uh, once you offer an IPT, at least uh, a detailed scan must be offered for all these women. 
And if there's abnormality detected, then it must be proceed with a more appropriate genetic testing to diagnose the condition. So normal, um, they, they won't come back as normal NIPT. They'll come back as low risk NIPT. So a low risk NIPT doesn't always mean 100% normal fetuses. Okay, so I'm going to show you this uh, a magazine in Australia showing about um, uh, the idea of prenatal testing. So um, in, in Australia, there's a lot of movement down to, to address this issue about uh, what is the right of the mother to decide whether they want to be tested or not. So uh, the 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 previous way of prenatal test actually give mothers uh, less option to decide. So um, it ha actually has uh, make a decision on its own uh, who will live and who will be this decide as, you know, not to be born. Just something to be pondered about. Okay. So what have changed? Uh, because of the changes in the research and also improvement in the uh, overall quality of life in Down syndrome, there's a lot of things has changed of the way we test. So this is a test that we have, which is good. And another is how we actually going to use the test in our uh, everyday care on the pregnant lady. Okay. So American guideline actually has uh, stated uh, their own um, uh, protocol of how to use it. So they uh, they actually uh, advise for all, despite age, despite risk factor, you you inform about what tests available, what are the options, what are the risks and benefit of each test test uh, in all pregnant women, despite of their age and risk. Okay, so they are more like um, open table give to all okay so if the patients prefer more comprehensive or more more um, more detail then they'll be offered even up to the point of uh, microarray which is a very extensive testing so uh, they stated in their guideline that and NPT, although it's a very sensitive and specific test, almost like similar to carotabing, but it's not equivalent to that. So this must be informed to all patients. And uh, even with the negative result of NIPT, the patient can choose to do a more intensive diagnostic testing. Okay. All women who have or don't have NIPT or any kind of testing should be offered second trimester ultrasound. So I, I didn't include the second trimester ultrasound as a screening for fetal anomaly. Why? Although it can detect about 18 uh, conditions, most of the gallon put in a systematic uh, way how to detect it, but uh, it is uh, operator dependent and uh, it need, uh, uh, re it need uh, more research in terms of to to provide um, uh, the, the predictions model in terms of predicting anomaly. That means you cannot say that using this standard, you must achieve 90% of anomalies. Unfortunately, we, we are not there yet. So it's different from center to center. Even in Malaysia, it is can uh, actually been offered by all. By, by sonographers, by GPs. So we are unable to uh, create a standard uh, prediction model in terms of uh, detecting uh, a list of anomalies. But it should be offered. Most guidelines actually said must be offered to all women. Okay, so in America, it's, it's, uh, their, their healthcare plans, their insurance uh, policies regarding NIPT. As you know, NIPT, although it's a good test, is expensive. So it cannot offer for all. And most insurance are actually varied state by state. Okay, so about 80% of insured patients in the US are covered for NIPT. So they are good. Uh, and then nearly 100% are covered in high risk pregnancy. Okay, so different uh, country has different uh, insurance policy. Okay, so how about UK? So back in 2015, they changed the way their, uh, their, their screening program has changed. Huh? So before this, everyone was offered. 
but now they actually give a two different uh, screening pathway. So first, you can either get the combination uh, of the NT and screening test um, to either uh, choose to screen only for three trisomies, only for 321, or only for 18 and 13, or not at all. Interesting, right? So, an IPT is offered uh, following a, uh, a better result. This is depends on center to center. So, if you choose to do an IPT, you don't have to do a combined or quadruple test. Hmm? Uh, another thing about NIPT, there is a possible of uh, no result, especially in those with high uh, with low fragment of DNA, like obese women, people with thyroid disease. So when you counsel the patient, you must be careful and tell them that there is a possibility of no result. It's, it's not inconclusive. You come, come back as no result because they, they're unable to detect any. Uh, the fragment of DNA is very low, so they cannot produce a good result. Okay, so in their, in their screening of fitness, they actually put the 20-week uh, screening scan pathway as their policy, similarly like uh, American guideline. So uh, this is the condition that was listed in the national policy. That means when you list it in the national policy, it must be detected. If it's missed, then it's considered negligence. Okay. This is Canada. So Canada, uh, almost less, uh, probably combined both. Uh, they actually offered for all conventional. Conventional means uh, anti-scan. Anti uh, NT means knuckle translucency, a thickness of the, uh, the skin fold over uh, behind the neck, uh, and uh, plus serum marker. So if this come back as low risk, then the straight away detail scan. Uh, if it's considered as high risk, they actually offered an IPT or cardiotyping. So if the patient choose for uh, an IPT, uh, so for, for, for this group of women, they're not to be negative, then we will deem as normal because you know the performance of an IPT. But if it's positive, they will offer a Cardiotyping, uh, and some women are offered cardiotyping straight. And for very high risk, <coughs> straight away uh, cardiotyping. Okay. Okay, almost going to be uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, I want to highlight this because um, the nature of an IPT of being a blood test make it very easily available. Uh, anyone can offer an IPT. Uh, by, by anyone, I mean uh, doctors working in uh, general, as a general practitioner and even some uh, lab in a certain lab without medical personnel actually offer an IPT. So this is... Uh, uh, a guideline produced by this uh, uh, paper uh, and they actually offered this as a very important pre-test counseling point. So testing is uh, optional. They must define the screening. That means you must tell them the screening is for what. Uh, even me as a uh, MFN specialist, I'm still using NIPT only for trisomy. And um, uh, it must decide, uh, they must explain the clinical features and variability of the conditions of the test to be done. So, I mean, you have to screen the mother whether they're obese, they have a certain uh, medical condition that might implicate the testing. They must know what technology is used because different labs are actually using different kind of technology. And now it makes it more difficult for us when they have different different kind of um, package of different price, make it the, 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 the constings are more difficult. They must have a, a standard reporting format. Okay, uh, must inform them the sensitivity of the test, the possible false positive of the rest and what 
and confirmation. How to confirm that number result? I mean, what's next? It comes back as positive. What's next? Okay. Usually, sensitivity, positive, negative behavior was, was actually listed in the report. Must inform the meditation as I informed before. And it can actually detect some other condition which is not intent to be test. And you must have a way to actually tell the patient if you have a positive test of a other condition, would you want to proceed or not? Then is this a turnaround time must be informed to the patient uh, timing. Okay, so just to share, like today I have received a referral from uh, doctors. Uh, in health clinic saying that uh, a 17 year old been offered of an IPT test and they come back as high risk for Down syndrome T21 and amniocentesis was done but unfortunately the reports came back as positive carotyping came back confirmed T21 and report actually received by the patients without post test counseling so this is just a pre test so you need to, to inform the patients early before the test was done, it's called pre-test counseling. Uh, what this, what to anticipate, uh, must be informed uh, in detail. If it's turned out to be low risk, what's next? If it to be to high risk, what's next? Huh? And uh, when the patients receive a post uh, post test result without counseling, the implication is big. Uh, they are emotional being. They are. Termination of pregnancies concern, this should be discussed even before testing was done. So if it's not done, that means you are not um you uh, you are probably you're not competent to do the testing, unfortunately. You know, you're not competent to offer the testing. Mm -hmm. So message to bring home from the very beginning, you as a healthcare provider must decide what level of provision of care that you want to give to the patients from the very beginning. Are you a just one off um, healthcare practices? I mean, in the process, because you know, from, for pregnant lady, it's different. You have to see from uh, prenatal, uh, first trimester, and the delivery. It's a process. It doesn't, it doesn't end with one uh, clinic setting, and that's it. The application is there for, and from for the whole continuous process of pregnancy, so you need to decide: Are you a just a provision of tests, or are you a the the real um antenatal care provider? So if you're not giving uh, the whole care, you and you're unable to provide the subsequent uh, management, especially in in term of uh, positive tests screening test, you must have a reference system in place. This is not just for NIPT, even for preeclampsia. I mean, if you actually diagnose preeclampsia, even in a mild form of preeclampsia, you're unable to follow up the patients because the nature of preeclampsia can occur suddenly, unexpectedly. And if you can't actually manage the patients, you must have a referral system. Uh, in, in government servants, much easier because the press system is already in place. But if you are working on your own, you have to decide from the beginning who are your endpoint. Are you going to refer to a private obstetrician or are you going to refer to a government setting? Uh, and and, and uh, please uh, develop that network, a uh, proper network from the very beginning. Huh? That means it's under your, under your responsibility to have that uh, networking. You must know all these test profile very well and know their limitations and must be able to manage uh, whatever the uh, implication of the testing to the patient. Uh, and uh, especially on the NIPT, even on preeclampsia -pre testing, this one of the novel tests that keep changing with time since it's still been under research. So we must keep updating on the knowledge because as you know, in terms of saturation, uh, things change uh, over years. Uh, a lot of things can happen. In the, even in the first five years of NIPT, there's a lot of changes occurred. So and in the end, uh, as we are all doctors under the Hippocratic Oaths, you must be responsible to the over care of the patients. Uh, with that, um, and thank you. That opens to so any question.
Thank you, Dr. Afida, for a very excellent and insightful talk. Actually, we learned a lot tonight. And we actually have four questions. Uh, for Q&A session, I'd like to invite Dr. Faiz uh, to, uh, for the Q&A with uh, Dr. Afida. So, welcome, Dr. Faiz. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Afida and Dr. Adila. Uh, not to forget our beloved participants as well for the willingness and uh, enthusiasm to join us on a weekend night. So we got four questions here, Dr. Fida. With the first two questions, I think they're asking about similar things. I saw I just summarized. Uh, does NIPT add more as a screening or diagnostic test? And once positive, do we proceed for amniosynthesis as a sequential testing? Okay. Uh, NIPT international still a screening test uh, if you uh, if, as i presented earlier screening tests should be have very high sensitivity but usually the sensitivity is a bit low but nbt is so good that can it has both uh, sensitivity and sensitivity high but there are limitations uh, because it's using DNA fragments of the uh, fetal DNA fragments. So it's a, dub, it's a double test. It's a, first, they have to collect the fetal uh, fragment of DNA and then they have to do another testing on the fetal fragment DNA. So MIT still have um, limitation and all international body stated is a screening test. So as for now, amniocentesis is when we need to put a needle into the uterus, take the sample, and do a chorotyping. That is the confirmation or diagnostic testing. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Fida, for such a great answer. And then uh, our next question, uh, can clinic kesihatan send the NIPT test? Okay. Uh, for governments, unfortunately, uh, we are giving opportunistic testing. Okay, so uh, as you know that for any genetic testing, we have to provide pre-counseling and post-counseling tests. So uh, as at this point, uh, some, I think almost all MFM's clinic are offering NIPT testing. So uh, we cannot provide a big number of testing. So as for now, we offered for those advanced maternal age, uh, 35 and above. Uh, as those has been offered NIPT testing. Uh, for those of the uh, lower age, uh, because this is quite misleading, because when you talk, oh, okay, more than 35 only uh, has risk of Down syndrome. No, every, actually, the risk of Down syndrome is um, uh, all over the age. Uh, uh, the risk is about 1 in 1,000 in overall, but the risk is higher in the age of 35 and above. But as term of government, for now we offer 35 and above, you need to refer us for pre-test counselling first, and then if they agree, then only we, we proceed, but the patient has to bear the cost. Uh, uh, yeah. All lab uh, in Malaysia are still provided by private lab, and we don't have government lab yet for NIPT. Okay, all right. Thank you very much again, Dr. Afida. So our next question would be, since thalassemia is quite prevalent in Malaysia, what can be offered to confirm during pregnancy regarding thalassemia major status of fetus? Okay, so this is a bit off topic because uh, when we talk mm -hmm. about uh, a screening, uh, I'm, I'm talking about universal screening, not specific screening. So for thalassemia, we we actually give a counselling uh, specifically for those with a, a trait, I mean carrier of thalassemia, if both, both parents carry the same trait. Um, so there's two types of thalassemia. Uh, uh, in Malaysia, alpha and beta. So both presentations are different. So for alpha, if they have all the four uh, genetics, huh, because uh, alpha carries four genes, then the baby can end up with uh, butt hydrops, means they can die in, in the womb. So uh, we are actually offered testing for the mother to do as early as 16 weeks. The price are different because this is a thalassemia screening. And if it's confirmed but uh, termination of pregnancy is offered. For beta, it's a bit tricky because uh, uh, although that one of the fatwa in for Muslim actually uh, mentioned that 
major beta can be offered termination of pregnancy uh, but uh, some some state fatwa actually against it so this one uh, uh, we but against we offer we offer uh, screening for uh, beta and alpha if both parents are carriers so yes you can refer to mfm specialist so uh, if it, it out, still a bit out of topic, uh, uh, another way of preventing of uh, thalassemia um, um, uh, genes being passed to the offspring is through um, uh, PGD, pre-implantation pre uh, diagnostic testing. This is before it was implanted to the uterus. That means it's only through IVF. So. Uh, I'm not the best person to talk about this. Maybe next time we can have infertility uh, reproductive specialist to talk about this. So it's a procedure when we actually take a biopsy of the embryo. And then uh, if we confirm as a major type, then uh, they, it will not be implanted. So there's this one you can prevent termination of pregnancy because termination of pregnancy, although can be done safely, it have impact to both maternal and physical health. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Fida. We take note on that. We can consider to, I mean, discuss this on a, another semi because I think this is another big topic on regards of uh, thalassemia and pregnancy. Okay, I just summarize our last, oh no, okay, a few last questions here. So, uh, is there any references in terms of counseling for NIPT and how much is the cost involved actually? Okay. Um if you want to follow the standard uh, for any genetic testing, uh, by right, pre-testing and post-setting should be done by genetic counsellor. But in Malaysia, we don't have many genetic counsellor. We have a few in University of Malaya and we have a few in Uni Uni uh, UKM uh, and some genetic lab actually have their in-house genetic counsellor. So, <laughs> because of you have to pay for this genetic counseling extra so because of that then most genetic counseling are done by those who actually um, provision of the test i mean who are offering the test uh, they are uh, they are responsible to do pre test genetic counseling so if you see my presentation just now uh, the last one i actually have um, uh, share one of the uh, study but i didn't give in detail but in that in that paper they actually explain uh, what is the best way to explain lah. but again because of the nature of the NIPT test uh, different from lab to lab you still have to uh, have to look at your lab first before you can offer it, it doesn't like one one counseling um, template fit all no unfortunately huh? Um, so you have to see your lab first, you have to go to the lab, uh, to your lab provider and ask few questions before you can actually give to the patient uh, some information. So the important one is you need to know the limitation. Uh, uh, if you ask me, <laughs> I think NIPT is best provided by obstetrician and above. Lah. Because if GPs, then if you are stuck with the, the result and your pre-test counseling is not adequate, then the patients will deem it as uh, negligence. Uh, especially if they, they get positive result and uh, things are not being discussed much earlier. All right, understood. Okay. So uh, I, think, I think I think someone asked about cost, right? The cost yeah. uh, the cost <laughs> yeah. different from lab to lab. So as okay. as low as seven hundred uh, to uh, thousand four hundred, but this is the rate that were given by the lab to uh, to government's uh, doctors. So maybe uh, in the private, the price are a bit different. So be careful when it was offered uh, cheap, because you need to know what are included in that test. Huh? it might not be adequate. Uh, all right. I think thank you very much, Dr. Fida. And I think that's that for our Q&A session. Unfortunately, we have come to our, our end of SME. Thanks again to Dr. Fida for a very insightful and amazing lecture. And uh, I hope everyone learned as much from the topic today. 
So not to forget, we will include in our chat box the link Google form for e-certificate and uh, one CPD point. And the Google form will be available for about 30 minutes. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And uh, we close our session. Welcome. Okay, thank you.